Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, back by popular demand, today's guest is Dr. Rachel Rubin, and she is going to be talking about hormones, specifically the symptoms of menopause and perimenopause that nobody warns you about. Please welcome her back to the show. Great topic, great guest. So happy to see you again. Thank you for having me. This has just been such an exciting time in menopausal medicine uh, where so many people are reaching out, so many people are getting on social media and saying, you don't have to suffer. Why aren't we giving it, women information about their bodies and what happens to their bodies? So uh, I have been so amazed with your platform and how many incredible humans you reach on a daily basis. So I begged you to let me back on so we can answer questions and also really get to the bottom of, well, it's not just hot flashes and night sweats. Yeah, maybe differentiate perimenopause, menopause, because I mean, people think they know what they mean, but what are those in a woman's health history? It is so confusing because even the medicine is so confusing. You don't know you're in perimenopause until much, much later. Uh, and then you look back and you say, wow, those 10 years were pretty uh, rocky. And nobody told me that this was hormonally related. So you can only say you are in past menopause when you have had a year of no menstrual cycles. Well, that's confusing for people who have IUDs in place. It's confusing for people who've had their uterus removed for various reasons. And so it's it's not so clear cut and easy. The average age of menopause is 52, which means now you've had a year of no periods and then you are menopausal forever. You never stop being in menopause. So it's really half your life almost if we're all going to live to be 112 because they eat the chef AJ way. And so period. <laughs> menopause can be the time period before that when things are getting rocky. It's sort of when your ovaries are, you know, using the last bit of eggs they have left and the energy that they have left. And, you know, you're running low on supplies and you're really just trying to do what you can. And that's when you can have this roller coaster, the highs and the lows, and that can come with so many symptoms. And so the point is not looking at your period. The point is, how are you feeling? And so I wanted to come back and just go over some of the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, because I find that patients are reaching out to me on Instagram every day saying, nobody will believe me. I think I'm in perimenopause. I'm 38 years old and everyone tells me I'm crazy. And then I'm too young. There is no too young and there is no too old. And it's really about symptoms and seeing a specialist in menopause who can really work with you, believe you, and you don't have to have have no periods to potentially start some treatment. Do you think that the time at which a, a woman first gets her period has to do with the trajectory of this? Because, you know, in ancient civilization, women didn't get periods till much later than today. You know, we don't know. Uh, and I think there's, you know, I just got off a research phone call with some incredible researchers where we were talking about androgen receptors in the menstrual cycle and how much, how little we know sort of about DNA and how your DNA affects, you know, how your body responds. Cause it's not just how the hormones in your body, it's how your body receives those hormones and acts on those hormones. And you and I may have different receptors that behave differently. I was saying how, you know, women who breastfeed, there are some women who get their periods back pretty quickly, even while breastfeeding. And there are some women who three years they're breastfeeding and have no period. And so we don't know on a big level of the, the changes and when you start getting your period versus when you go through menopause. I was always taught, now I don't know the data behind this, that I always ask patients, well, when did your mom go through menopause? You know, sometimes there's some similarities in family members, although I don't know how good that data actually is. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, right before we logged down, we were talking about the diet that I recommend, which is an unprocessed whole food plant-based diet. And I found that, you know, a, a diet is often underestimated or overlooked because a lot of people are like, I don't need, I don't have any symptoms. I'm so lucky of any of this and either do, do my sister, but we've been eating this way for so many years and we don't drink alcohol. We don't have caffeine. So I think, you know, doesn't a little bit have to do with a person's lifestyle habits a little bit? Absol I absolutely think lifestyle matters. I, I don't know if I can ask this live on air, Chef. AJ, how old are you? Can you tell oh, me? Oh, I'm 63. Yeah. So it's really, you know, and honestly, I feel, I, I always wonder for people who have no symptoms, you know, how are your, is your bone density going to stay strong, right? Is your risks of heart disease, you know, of course get better with a good diet and things like that. And so sometimes I think people have horrible symptoms early, get on certain treatments early, and maybe they're luckier in some ways, you know, not lucky in other ways, uh, but because we don't associate certain symptoms with menopause. And so we think, oh, I'm fine. I don't need any treatments. I don't need anything. And I think part of that is not understanding necessarily what all the symptoms really are. Yeah. Well, maybe tell us what they are. And I'm curious, do men have something similar with their? Yeah. 
so men can have an age related decline in their testosterone levels. And we treat a lot of uh, low testosterone, but they never like women go through menopause, right? They don't fully lose unless they have metastatic prostate cancer and we have to remove all the testosterone from their body. They don't typically go to zero. Whereas women after age around 52, right? Your estrogen levels go to zero, uh, essentially zero, right? As pretty low to zero as the lab can find. And men maintain an estrogen of about 25 and usually testosterone testosterone is somewhere between 300 and a thousand for many men. And so some can get symptoms of low hormone states, but not nearly as, as, as a hundred percent as women do, right? Women, it's a hundred percent of the time. And so symptoms of menopause and perimenopause, let's talk about mood symptoms, right? Many people have anxiety or brain fog or depression. Many people have migraines or headaches. Uh, you know, this is a patient said this to me recently, L light and noise sensitivity can happen. She said, oh my gosh, when my kids kids and husband are yelling. I just, I just want to rip my hair out, uh, which I didn't do before. Uh, some people have a lot of fatigue, energy issues, getting tired easily heart palpitations. This is one Oprah said recently that her only symptom of menopause was heart palpitations. And she went to five different doctors and nobody picked up that this was perimenopause. As soon as she started on her estrogen therapy, everything got better. And Oprah just did a big menopause uh, uh, a conference where she was like, no one is taking away my estrogen. Um, you know, of course, hot flashes and night sweats, everybody talks about those, but nobody really talks about how the bladder symptoms affect menopause. So um, you've got a lot of urinary tract infections and urinary frequency and urinary urgency and pain with intercourse. Um, irritability can happen. Joint pain. That one was like, as a urologist, I'm a urologist. And, and as a urologist, you know, I wasn't expecting me to treat patients saying, oh my gosh, Dr. Rubin, my joints feel so much better. I wake up in the morning. I don't feel like an old lady. You know, I feel pretty good. Um, and of course I'm a sex doctor, so I deal with low libido and pain with sex and things like that. But then also, you know, the skin, hair and nails. So many people say everything is so dry. My hair is falling out. My eyes are so dry. My skin is so dry. I can't sleep, right? Sleep is another real a, a common issue. If you can't sleep, you can't do anything, right? So, so these are just some of the many symptoms that can happen, you know, in perimenopause and menopause. Right. Absolutely. So when, when does a woman know that it's that, that she should seek help for or something else? Because some of those symptoms could be other things as well. Absolutely. So I think the really important thing is to know that not all doctors are all knowing, right? You don't want to come see me about um, gosh, your uh, cancer issues. You don't want to see me about your blood pressure issues. You don't want to see me about your autoimmune condition, but you want to see me about your menopausal issues and how that affects your blood pressure and your autoimmune condition and things like that. And so there are specialists within the menopausal world and that you can find at the North American Menopause Society website. There's a great website, uh, iswish, isswsh.org, uh, where we deal with the sexual uh, medicine effects you know, of sexual of, of menopause. And so you have to find uh, clinicians who are just knowledgeable about this because most doctors, I mean, we have research showing that less than 7% of doctors get any training on menopause at all. So your doctor is not going to associate your bladder symptoms with menopause, even though that's a hundred percent, even if you're 70, the bladder, your bladder symptoms are likely related to hormone changes. Yeah, you talked about that and why you like the like the things like the Uva Fem and, and Estrace for people for that, that it, people don't realize that it all works together. And, you know, Peggy, who's watching live, says she's 60 and at 33, she was diagnosed as perimenopausal. You know, this is the, one of the things I appreciate so much about you is you're such a great voice for this and an advocate because it's like anything down there people don't want to talk about. And what I hear so much from my viewers, you know, when they write questions anonymously is how much sex hurts when they get older. Yeah. And that's really a hormonal problem, right? Because right, babies don't have hormones and their tissue is thin. It's raw. It's irritable. We, diaper cream was invented because the tissue is so tender looking, right? And then hormones is what makes the tissue uh, lubricate and stretch. And you can put tampons in and have sex. Hormones are really important for the genital and urinary health. And so as you go through perimenopause and menopause, it gets worse and worse and worse over time. The longer you are away from not having hormones, the 
skin gets thin, it gets dry, it bleeds, it cracks. Sex is very painful and it is totally curable. It's not just like, it's not just band-aidable, it's curable with safe vaginal hormones, which everyone can take pretty much. In fact, I would argue there is no one who cannot take it. Sometimes we have a few extra conversations with a cancer doctor if we need to, but there's no one on earth, blood clots, history of blood clots, history, family histories of cancer, current histories of cancer. There's no 100% contraindication. Sometimes we just need to have a few extra conversations about it. Right. Uh, people are always, I'm not all people, but looking for like a more natural way to do things often. So there, there is nothing more natural than giving your body back the hormones that it no longer has. And so I really encourage patients to think about local hormones and we could talk about whole body hormones, local hormones as about as natural as it gets. I always joke. It is the only essential oil uh, that actually exists because it really fixes the problem. And so listen, I mean, we have a solution there are no, like, there's nothing more natural than your own, you know, the hormones that your body no longer has. So I really encourage patients not to think of it like medication. It's more like a, a moisturizer, or you can call it a supplement if it makes you happy, you know, that actually fixes the underlying problem and fixes the tissue and prevents urinary tract infections, which as we know, can kill you if you aren't careful. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't have to worry about this in the stone age because they didn't live long enough to see menopause. <laughs> Well, you know, that may or may not be true. And I think, you know, this idea is as we get older and as technology gets better and as Chef AJ keeps everybody alive with her amazing, you know, nutrition advice, right? I think we do want to be sexually active longer. We have Viagra. We want to keep up with our partners, you know, longer. We, we, we want to have a good libido and we don't want to die of a urinary tract infection. And so I think as technology and medicine get better, right, we have to say, well, what quality of life do I want? Right. Um, I had a patient recently who said, gosh, I can't take vaginal hormones. Those cause cancer, which they don't. There's zero evidence that they do. And everybody should follow me on my social media because I constantly reinforce the fact that these, uh, these things are safe. And meanwhile, she was in so much pain. She couldn't sit. She was on narcotics. She had no quality of life and she didn't want to take something because she thought was dangerous, but her life has no quality to it because she's in so much pain because of the lack of hormones in her tissue. So it's really getting a doctor to just sit with you to who understands these things and can explain it in a way to make you feel safe and comfortable and empowered. Because I find when patients understand why they're doing a uh, certain therapy, you know, you can't do hormone. You can't take hormones because Ruben says it says you should. You have to take it because you've read about it. You understand it. You've you've looked at the data. Um, that's what that's what really helps women make decisions about their bodies. Yeah, are there certain tests that uh, that we can take? Women can take to to see what their levels are. Do you recommend them at a certain age or only if they are experiencing symptoms? Yeah, this is where it's really challenging because in perimenopause, you go like this roller coaster. So labs are not all, not necessarily helpful and don't actually show you what's going on because if your labs are low one day, but you're still cycling randomly, they may be high two days later. They may be, you know, so we tend to treat symptoms. Now in my, in my, I do use labs of, you know, just uh, insurance-based blood tests that sometimes can give us a snapshot because testosterone can be helpful to look at, at the number and look at the labs. But some of these companies that are doing saliva testing and you're spending a lot of money on labs, you don't really need to. And I think some of the testing has gone overboard and doesn't necessarily help us when we then decide how to manage the person. And so I think there's a lot of predatory behavior out there. And I'm, if you've done it, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, you wasted your money, but it's not always giving us all the information that we need. And sometimes it's, it's, you have to, when you're, when someone's suggesting that you have to say, well, are they making money off of this test? Are they really, is it going to change our management? Um, and, and what are we doing here? Which is why we also tend to stay away from like pellets and, and very expensive hormone therapies because we have very inexpensive FDA approved options that are just as bioidentical, that are just as natural as sort of what many of these, um, uh, um, practices are offering. Yeah. Thank you. I want to take a few questions that came in from, uh, I would the, love it. Thank you so much. I, I, most of them are kind of on topic, but it's definitely in your field though, if it's not exactly on menopause and, um, always put anonymous if you want it at the beginning, because I say put it at the end and I read their name. So this one is from Mary and she says, Dr. Rubin, what causes the pelvic floor to drop the sensation of loose muscle tone after menopause and how can it be treated and can it be reversed? 
Yeah. So it's really important, right? Hormones matter. Think Arnold Schwarzenegger and testosterone. He's got these big, huge muscles. So muscle needs hormones. Muscle needs hormone. You know, estrogen and testosterone are probably important for muscles. And so as your body no longer has hormones in it, the muscles can get thin, they can atrophy just like the tissue can. And so if, you know, that's why weightlifting is so important in menopause, right? This is Chef AJ. She's such a good exerciser, right? She's constantly working on her muscles. And it's really important to think about that for your pelvic floor, because your pelvic floor is just a bowl of muscle that is holding up all of your organs, your vagina, your uterus, your bowels. And as menopause happens, it gets thinner, it gets, it gets uh, more lax. Uh, and so it's really important to work with somebody who understands this. And often we send people to what's called pelvic floor physical therapy to train because, you know, some of these apps and YouTube videos and, and these expensive things that you buy, they're not customized to your pelvic floor. And what I find is that some people's pelvic floors are too tight and some people's are too loose and some people it's just dysfunctional. And so working with a pelvic floor physical therapist can be very helpful because they can customize your, you know, treatment strategy for you specifically. I was so lucky. I had one shadowing me in my office yesterday and I've, I woke up the other day with bad sciatica. My back is killing me. And I said, can you please help me? Can you please work with me? And she was right there in my office and she was able to give me stretches and exercise. And she said, you're, you're sitting all the time like this. And she said, you gotta sit, you gotta be a little bit more, you know, extended. Whereas if I just went on Google, you know, I may get the wrong advice and do the wrong, you know, the wrong strategy. Yeah. I think a lot of people uh, started uh, Estrace and Yuva Femme from your show. One of the viewers is saying that she did because of you and, and it, she's feeling great. I did too, actually. <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't like the cream. So I got the, you know, the, the no. insert. Yeah. yeah creams, like you know, cre creams can sometimes be messy and goopy and women don't love uh, plunging creams into their vaginas. But my friend uh, gave me a tip, which actually helped me understand creams a little bit better. We don't just glop on creams on our face, right? You put, you rub it in. And so if you have a cream and the creams are the cheapest option, so your insurance may cover the inserts, but if you don't have insurance or, or your insurance is costing a lot of money, you can have your doctor prescribe it to good R, you know, get good RX coupon or use Mark Cuban's online pharmacy, $20 for a tube of estrace cream. It's the cheapest of all the options. And so when you take it, you take at least a gram and you rub it into the walls of the vagina, as opposed to just plunging it in. So that way it's not as messy. And when my friend taught me that, I said, that makes perfect sense. That's a really good workaround because I agree with you. The creams can sometimes be a little messy. Yeah. Thank you. This is from Donna. And she says, I had a complete hysterectomy at age 38, uterus and ovaries. My mother died of ovarian cancer at 45, and I've been on HRT for the past 25 years. I've tapered off over the years. I'm off now, but symptoms are disrupting normal sleep patterns and therefore quality of life. Are small doses of estrogen via creams or patches advised at all? I would probably say yes. I'm yeah. How old is, how old she said, how old she was? Ooh, let's Did see. She, she, she didn't say that's okay. So, yeah. Well, so she's wait, been, wait, wait. She, yeah, I think so. Because she said hysterectomy at 38 and HR. Yeah. And H past 25. So I'm going to guess she's 38 plus 25, which is 62 ish. Yeah. So, so this is where um, it, it's important. So our old teaching, the old teaching was, gosh, hormones are dangerous. They're going to kill you. So you have to be on it for the shortest amount of time possible. And that is no longer true. And so if you are having symptoms, it's really important to talk with someone who understands it because I, for certainly local therapy is a hundred percent important and you should be on local therapy in the vagina to prevent urinary tract infections. But when it comes to your libido, right? Testosterone is very safe for you to be on when it comes to estrogen through the skin, right? We actually um, find that safer from a blood clot perspective, as opposed to taking an estrogen pill by mouth. And so if you were in my office, we would have the discussion about your individual risk factors. And we talk about pros and cons and what makes the most sense for you. And what's funny is we love to tell women what they cannot do with their bodies. But what about just explaining the risks and the benefits and you deciding what you want to do with your body, right? Like you get to choose, you knew what life felt like on treatment. You know what life feels like off treatment. If you understand the risks uh, and what people are afraid of, why can't you make adult decisions for what you decide to put into your body, right? People consume alcohol, which we know has breast cancer risks and serious risks. You get to decide. And so my job is to give information, but ultimately I have to empower my patient to make good decisions for their body. 
Great. Thank you. One of the viewers says that because of watching you on my show, she's now on a line estradiol 10 milligrams twice a week for your recommendations. It's working now. And I had my sex life expanded to include vaginal sex for the first time in years. Congratulations. And she's thanking you. She said she found a product called Reverie, which is hyaluronic acid and sodium salt. And it claims to do the same thing as estradiol without the hormones. Is it safe to use in addition to the estradiol or can it be substituted for the estradiol? Yeah. Oh, I love the question. And what a world that someone watching me on a YouTube channel is able to have her sex life back. Like, can y'all understand? This is why I begged Chef AJ to bring me back onto the show because she's not my patient. I've never met her before. This is incredible. Reverie is a hyaluronic acid moisturizer. And so it used to be, well, it still is, unfortunately, that the menopause guidelines say if someone has pain with sex, the first line therapy is moisturizers and lubricants because they help make sex a little bit more uh, painless and they're kind of like band-aids. The problem is those have never been proven to prevent urinary tract infections or help with the other symptoms of genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So I never think of them as first line therapy. I think of them as you can use them anytime as band-aids to help make things even more comfortable during the day. If you have dryness or with sex, lubricant is great for everyone, right? Nobody doesn't benefit from lubricant, but lubricant actually doesn't, isn't the only therapy when you have pain with sex, it's just a band-aid. So for a lot of people, they use the lubricant, but it's still painful. And so what I would tell your listener is, yes, add all the hyaluronic acid you want. Uh, there is data to show that it definitely helps moisturize the tissue. It helps decrease pain with sex, but don't use it in, don't do it instead of using the vaginal estrogen, which is safe, effective, and absolutely wonderful. Thank you. This is from Fluffy. She says, can you please talk about surgical menopause? My doctors don't seem to know very much about it, even my gynecologist or yeah, my gyno so oncologist, gyno so oncologist. So surgical menopause is done for many reasons, people. And what surgical menopause means is you have your ovaries removed. And so it may be that you had cancer and you had to have your uterus and ovaries taken out. It may be that you had a family history of a, a severe gene that puts you at risk for cancer and your doctors recommend you have your ovaries removed. It's really important that when that happens, you have a plan with your medical team of what happens once your ovaries are removed. And I can't speak for everybody that everybody's the same, but but, it, but we know that hormone therapy is really helpful to protect your bones from osteoporosis, to protect your heart from cardiovascular disease. Uh, and of course, you know, sexual side effects like low libido and pain with intercourse, there are reasons to be on hormone therapy at surgical menopause. And what we find is that the symptoms of surgical menopause are so much worse than a natural menopause because natural menopause tends to be, you know, kind of over time, you're losing hormones. And for some people like Chef AJ, they don't notice anything. It's a slow sort of, they don't notice things, but when, when, you know, you have hormones in your body and boom, the next day they're gone because you've had your ovaries removed. It can be a very harsh, you know, wake up call. Great. Thank you. This is from Jan. She says I'm 59 eating a whole food plant-based diet. Can hormones be at an optimal level eating this way? And I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Neil Barnard, the founder of PCRM. He wrote a book called your body in balance, where he talks a lot about this and soy and things like There's that. There's a lot, you know, it's so funny. I was just at a, a really great lecture about phytoestrogens and soy products and what the data is. And I'm learning all the time, new things. Now I, you know, I'm all sort of one of these people of like, why does it have to be all or nothing? Like, why can't we individualize it and encourage good diet and good nutrition, but also not tell women that, or people in general, that everything can be cured with diet and exercise, because I think we're also telling women, we'll just try harder, just eat better, just be more clean, do more yoga, do more breathing. Your body has no estrogen and testosterone in it. And there are consequences to that for some people. And so it really has to be individualized. If plant-based is working for you and you have no symptoms, it's not, you don't have to take hormones. Hormones are not for everybody, but by then telling your friends that they shouldn't do hormones because soy is going to replace all of their symptoms, I think is unkind. You know, it's like the women who told me, well, I did natural childbirth, so you don't need an epidural. I needed the epidural, right? Like my, <laughs> I, I, there was no way when I had my induced labor that I was going to do that. You know, those women, God bless them, but that's not for me. Right. And so I really think it's important that we understand that not everybody has the same symptoms, the same receptors, the same uh, metabolism of these products. And so um, if it's working for you, that's fabulous. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, Marie would like to know what effect does estrogen dysregulation have on fat storage? I noticed that many women put on weight around the middle abdomen at menopause, even thin women. And this has been harder to shift the, than other fat. For me. It is horrible right there. there, And I am by no means a, a weight expert, uh, but I do know that metabolism absolutely changes around menopause. And that includes issues around the middle and the things that were working for you before are no longer working. So what I say is hormone therapy is one of those things that I find with my patients. It helps prevent worsening of those issues. Often it doesn't necessarily reverse the issues, but it's kind of a part of the treatment strategy that we employ to help patients, you know, uh, carry weight better. But what I care about more is healthy, how they feel, how they're exercising, you know, that they're looking at nutrition and exercise and, and that we're, you know, not focused on, you know, uh, uh, all of the aesthetic pieces, although I know that's important to people. And I know testosterone can be very helpful as well. Um, now at most of our data is for libido, but I do see patients noticing, you know, muscle distribution that changes. Thank you. This one is from anonymous. And she says that after multiple pregnancies and vaginal births, she has a recto seal. It's been operated on once several years ago, failed, the symptoms are bad. She needs assistance to perform a bowel movement. I'm not constipated, but she can't have it without, a, you know, whatever it's called, you know, digital, Plinting, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, uh, anyway, finger assistance. And she's tired of this. She says she's considering a new surgery to repair this but she likes to run and do, do strength training. And she wondered if the first operation failed because of the running, she doesn't want to stop exercising. Would it be worth it to have another surgery? If the condition will recur, she doesn't want to stop her exercise. And do you, you have a recommendation for a good doctor in the United States that could do this? Yeah. So those doctors you typically work with are urogynecologists who work on rectoceles and there's multiple different surgical approaches that they can take. And I, you know, that's where working with a pelvic floor physical therapist, which I'm sure she has, you know, is very helpful because you need someone who understands exercise, who understands, uh, um, you know, it's funny, doctors don't see people in motion. We only see people standing still. And I heard from a physical therapist lecture the other week that said, you know, sex is a contact sport, right? You are constantly moving and changing and adjusting and running, of course, as a contact is, is, you know, you're moving a lot. So physical therapists understand this at a level that doctors just do not. And so having a team approach to figure out what is the best way to keep your goals aligned, because you don't want to, you know, you want your rectocele treated, but you also want to maintain your active lifestyle and they're both important and it's okay to get a few opinions, to talk to a few different people. And what I always tell patients is you make the best decision after you gather all the information, you make the best decision possible. And then it works out a lot of times and sometimes it doesn't, but you don't regret the decisions that you made. Great. Thank you. Jenny would like to know, are there any foods that can reduce or minimize hot flashes? She buys dried soybeans and sprinkles them on her salad after she cooks them. She says it helped for a while, but not very much anymore. And she's 52. So 52, again, this is where you need and must see a menopause specialist because the point is not everything can be cured with diet and exercise, and there are many safe and effective therapies. And so I encourage you to follow us on social media because I'm po constantly posting my reposting my friends and posting uh, uh, the information so that people understand that they, they don't have to suffer um, and what they think is dangerous or cancer causing or absolutely contraindicated is not always the case. Great. Thank you. Molly wants to know, she said she had an ablation, a uterus ablation in her late forties. What effect does a procedure like that have on a woman's course in menopause? Yeah, it's very interesting. So ablation means that they sort of um, scar down the lining of the uterus so you don't bleed. And for most people, it works. And for sometimes people, it fails and 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 they get it because they're kind of bothered. They're done with bleeding. They don't want to bleed anymore. Um, if you were to choose to do now, it's sometimes difficult to know when you are officially menopausal because you're not bleeding. And so we look at uh, sometimes your symptoms. Do you have hot flashes? Do you have night sweats? Some people can check lab values. Um, you know, if you want to see what your 
FSH levels are, which kind of tell us if, if, you know, it signals to us that menopause is happening, but of course your symptoms are the most important thing. Now, if you were to choose to go on hormone replacement therapy or menopause hormone therapy, as we, we often call it, um, it, you have a uterus, which means we still have to protect it, even though you're not bleeding. So we do. So if you take estrogen for your whole body, this is different from vaginal estrogen, but if you take estrogen for your whole body to help with hot flashes, night sweats, or prevent osteoporosis, um, you have to protect the uterus from uterine cancer. And we do that with progesterone. So you would still need progesterone as part of your regimen for hormone therapy. I hope that was helpful. Yes. Thank you. And we got through the questions that were submitted. We really appreciate when you send them in advance because they get priority, but we'll take a few from the chat now for as much time as Dr. Rubin has. And Dina says, could you please address bone density issues for women who are now past menopause? Yeah. You know, um, as a urologist, I will not claim to be a bonehead, uh, which is what my friends call my osteoporosis specialist friends call themselves boneheads. But I think osteoporosis is pretty frustrating place because um, bones, nobody, you have to see someone who specializes in bones. And I find that sometimes those people are not menopause specialists. And so they don't always understand the hormonal connections. And so I wish we cared about bones in the early fifties where people are starting. That's when bone density starts to drastically decline is sort of in this perimenopause, early menopause period. But our doctors aren't checking bone density scans and Medicare and the insurance companies aren't paying for bone density scans typically until later. They want to start at 65. Well, at that point, you're not not as much of a candidate for hormone therapy because we know estrogen prevents fractures and things like that. Whole body estrogen prevents fractures. And so I like, I want us to be talking about bones for the women in their early fifties, late forties, early fifties, because then they can make decisions about what they do and what kind of therapies they want. So that at 65, they're not having to make decisions sort of about their osteoporosis and osteopenia. So we know, um, again, I know that's not the perfect answer, but weightlifting is very helpful. Seeing a bone specialist is helpful. We have lots of other therapies for, for osteoporosis that don't include hormone therapies, but the, the prevention is something I'm very interested in because I want to prevent the, the breakdown of bone, of bone density. Right. Thanks. Uh, Chantel says, could eating soybeans mimic HRT treatment? I've never seen studies. So we, we, I was at that lecture and the studies were a bit equivocal, uh, meaning they were not home runs for my goodness, man, just eat this much soy and do this much phytoestrogens and you're good. You will not have hot flashes. And so what I, I'm also not saying that it can't help some people. And so, um, the data is mixed. And so you need to figure out what works for you. But I think the idea that hormones are dangerous and cause cancer. So I must just replace all of it with soybeans is not evidence-based and not true. And so it's important that you, you seek guidance in people who truly understand your story, because it's really hard to gather from the internet, customized approach to kind of what is going on with you, what your risk factors are, what are you afraid of, and kind of walk you through the treatment strategy. I'm allergic to soy. So that wouldn't have been an option for me anyway, if I had had that. So there's, and there's other people too, as well. Rachel says her mom died of ovarian cancer at 52. She's 42 and she was on the birth control pill from age 15 to 31 and has since had three kids, but she's done having them. Should she go back on the pill? Um, so, um, again, it's important and I'm sorry about your mom. Um, you know, these individualized stories, a lot of it is, it really depends. So birth, you, you got to understand what are your genetic risk factors? What are your doctors telling you about your genetic risk factors? What are they doing to watch for, you know, ovarian tumors and things like that? And some people get ultrasounds and, and that sort of a thing. A lot of people treat perimenopause with birth control pills. And it's great because it replaces some estrogen. It prevents pregnancies, which it sounds like she's not interested in babies anymore. And for many people, they do very well on birth control pills. It's not a bad perimenopause treatment. Many perimenopause people get hormonal based IUDs like a Mirena, which is another really good birth control method and also method to make you not bleed in perimenopause. And so there's different ways to treat perimenopause. It's not all good or all bad, all right or all wrong. Many people have side effects of birth control pills, mood issues, weight issues, or low libido or sexual pain issues. So it's important to that we take a customized approach to each person's perimenopause. Great. Thank you. Hey, I just saw a question. Oh, from Susanna. After seeing you on Chef AJ, I got my doctor to prescribe estrogen cream. He has me on a half a gram twice a week, but you mentioned a one gram dose. Should I up the dose myself or ask the doctor? 
you certainly can use one gram twice a week. You're not increasing any risk of stroke, heart attack, blood clot, cancer, risk of anything by going to one gram twice a week. If you're finding your symptoms are fine with half a gram twice a week, you're totally good to go. Um, and so it really, that's a, it's a, you're, you're totally fine to try the one gram and see if you get a little extra boost. Now in my office, I have pH paper, which is very helpful. We take a little swab with a Q-tip in the vagina. We put it on the pH paper and the goal is for a, a pH of four and a half. The vagina is supposed to be acidic. So I had a lady in my office yesterday. Her pH was seven and a half. I showed her the pH paper. I said, this is blue. This is terrible. You're going to come back in two months. It's going to be green. It's going to be perfect. And you're going to feel better, which is the most important thing. So that can be, so if you get urinary tract infections, but you're on therapy, do that pH test to say, wow, my pH isn't better. So maybe I'm not using the therapy correct. Maybe I need to go to that one gram. Maybe I need a different treatment because sometimes we have to tweak it a little bit. Well, I, that is so cool. Can we test this ourselves? Can we buy these strips and test ourselves or do we have to go to the doctor? Uh, you know, n- m- most doctors don't have pH paper in their office. We buy it special. I think we get it on Amazon. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's, it's narrow banded pH paper, four and a half to seven and a half. And so uh, my guess is you can probably buy pH paper on Amazon. That is cool. I want to do that. I want to test mine. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, everyone talks about, you know, it's important, you know, urine pH is different from vaginal pH, which is different from other pHs. So it's not, you know, when people talk about, oh, is this acidic or is this alkaline? You know, it sort of depends on the body structure, right? Your stomach is supposed to be acidic. Your vagina is supposed to be acidic. Sometimes too much acid in your urine can be uh, harmful and, you know, can induce kidney stones or pain or things like that. So sometimes we play with urine acidity a little bit. So the answer is the body part, it depends. Wow. That is really interesting. So you want it around four and a half. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so cool. I'm going to ask my doctor if she'll test that or I'll look for the strips myself. Jennifer says she's been on CBIEST hormone cream and progesterone pill of 200 milligrams a night. Is this as safe as what you are recommending? So um, what you're doing is compounded hormones uh, for your estrogen. And so here's the deal. Is it safe? So Let's talk about compounded products. So there, um, when that big scary study came out in the early 2000s called the Women's Health Initiative that scared the bejesus out of everyone and told everyone hormones were dangerous, so many doctors were afraid to prescribe hormones. So compounding pharmacies started doing it and started using similar, you know, what they called bioidentical products, and they started giving it to patients in creams and gels and things like that. Well, since that study came out, we have many bioidentical options that are approved by the FDA that are regulated, that we know what's in them. And so it's really important that if you're getting compounded products that, you know, that you know that there are probably less expensive FDA approved options that you could be using. Now it's also important. I'm very happy to hear that that person takes a progesterone pill every night because progesterone creams that are compounded have never been proven to protect the uterine lining from cancer. And so you are at an increased risk if you're using a progesterone cream for uterine protection. But what what I find in my patients who come to see me on the types of creams that you're describing is when we check their hormone levels by blood, you know, at LabCorp or through their insurance, we find that their estrogen levels are still very, very low and they're still having symptoms. So essentially they're spending a lot of money on creams that are not necessarily getting them to therapeutic levels. And so what I would say is if it's, I, I can't say specifically to you that you're hurting yourself, you're harming yourself, and this is terrible, but you may be spending a lot of money on a product where there's something your insurance will cover that is just as bioidentical, that is arguably more effective because the doses might be a little bit more absorbed by your body because it's a little bit more regulated. Thank you. Connie says, is there a concern with late onset menopause 61? Could that have an increased risk for cancer? Um, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I know exactly what the data shows there. And so I think again, everyone experiences menopause differently. And if you're 61, you had normal periods up until 61. And now you're, you stop getting periods and you're having hot flashes or night sweats, you deserve to be offered a treatment. And so I think it really is an individualized discussion with somebody who understands menopause, who can work with you specifically. Thanks. And there is it safe for me to stay on S string, an intravaginal ring, which I've been on for 10 years? 
Yes, never take it out till death do you part with that E-string. <laughs> you want to change it every three months. It, E-string is a local vaginal hormone, and it's a ring that goes in the vagina and stays in for three months at a time. And it is so fabulous for patients who are getting older, who have dexterity issues in the nursing home. I have many dementia patients who use this, uh, and it's so wonderful because the doctor or the nurse or somebody can put it in, take it out. The patient can put it in and take it out, and it's just incredible. It's often very expensive and hard to get. I just heard it when uh, the patent ran out. And so I'm praying it becomes, there becomes an affordable generic product because it's a fabulous option. So please use it till death do you part. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Kelly says, I just turned 49 and still have an IUD. Is this okay? I love IUDs in perimenopause because what happens is now if you, you're not bleeding, right? You've got birth control and you're not bleeding very much. Or if you're bleeding, you may just have light spotting and you're protecting your uterus with local progestin. So remember I said, if you use whole body estrogen, you have to protect your uterus from uterine cancer with progesterone. You can do that with an IUD. You can do that with oral uh, progesterone or vaginal progesterone. There's a couple different ways to do it. And so I love IUDs. And if you're starting to get hot flashes or night sweats or anything, Thing like that, you could consider estrogen therapy at that point if it's right for you and your personal uh, medical situation. Thanks. Let's see who said this. Uh, you, Rachel, ha- it is crazy how many like people that you have watching on a Friday. You know, it's just <laughs> I know, incredible. I know. I love them. I like. How, how do you find such motivated, brilliant, educated, incredible people? Yeah. Like, I, I just know. don't understand. I know we get great. I, just lucky. I don't know, you know, so thank you. Uh, so Rachel says, I thought if you take unopposed estrogen, it could increase your risk of developing uterine cancer. Yeah. That's when you use whole body systemic therapy. So if you're using, so for your hot flashes or night sweats, um, you know, bone protection, you're using patches or gels or oral pills. Yes. You must use progesterone to protect your uterus. If you're using vaginal hormones, these are low dose vaginal hormones. So the E string, the, va- the Uva Femme, Vagia Femme, Estrace cream, those doses are minuscule compared to the whole body doses. And data shows that you do not need to use a progesterone own in those cases. So just to give you an example, because I think it's really important. If I were to give, I don't give much oral estrogen because it's not as good for libido. So I like uh, patches and and what we call transdermal products. But if I were to give you an estrogen pill for your hot flashes, we typically give about two milligrams. A uvafem or vagifem insert is twice a week, 10 micrograms. So the difference between 10 micrograms twice a week and two milligrams every single day is a big difference, right? Nice. My gynecologist, says Michelle, suggested DHEA inserts instead of estrogen. Is this just as good? Oh, it's just as good. And I would argue, I I can't say it's better because I have no proof, but I love DHEA inserts. So there's an FDA approved product called Intra Rosa, which is vaginal DHEA. Now DHEA is the precursor to estrogen and testosterone. So what happens when you use this product is you put the DHEA in the vagina and the enzymes in your vagina make it into estrogen and testosterone. And we know that the bladder, the urethra, the vulvar vestibule, the vagina, the vulva need both estrogen and testosterone. So DHEA is the only FDA approved product that we have that adds a little bit of androgen to the tissue. So the problem is it's often not greatly covered by insurance. Sometimes your doctor has to write an additional letter or prior authorization. You can get it for $85 a month cash price, which is often unaffordable for our patients. And so I love uh, Intrarosa vaginal DHEA and I'll be presenting data at the American Urologic Association meeting next week that it also prevents urinary tract infections, just like vaginal estrogen. So they're pretty interchangeable. So if you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing great on my estrogen, but I should take DHEA, you're probably fine. You know, we give, you know, I I think you're okay. But if you find I'm using estrogen, I'm still getting UTIs or I still have pain with sex, ask your doctor to switch you to Intrarosa, which is a nightly vaginal DHEA product that we have some data to show that that it actually fixes those patients who are not getting the benefit from vaginal estrogen. That is, I just, I'm, you blow my mind. I'm, I'm taking notes for this. So, but if you were already on something like UVFM or Estrace, you wouldn't take it in addition. It would be in not in a, not typically. No, it's instead of because it would replace it. It's a great question. Wow, thank you. So, Arlene says I am postmenopausal and I have high testosterone levels. What would cause this? I am a long distance runner. 
Well, it's a good question. And the answer is, I would be interested to know what your sex hormone binding globulin levels or SHBG levels were because your free testosterone may be high. It may not be high. And I don't know when you say high, I don't high to the lab uh, values is not always high. And so I get patients who text, who message me say, oh my God, my testosterone is so high. And I don't always agree with them with the, the lab value. And so the question is, do you have excess hair? Do you have a giant clitoris or is your voice deepening? Do you have an adrenal problem because the adrenal glands make testosterone as well. And so the question, is it really high or is it just, you know, a good healthy level that your adrenal glands are making, you know, you're lucky to have nice, nicely work functioning adrenal glands. Right. People are asking if you do any virtual consults or does somebody have to go, I believe, to Washington DC to see you. Yeah. So I want everyone to sign up for our newsletter at rachelrubinmd.com. We have a newsletter that I send out. Um, you know, I don't spam people, but I let them know about great events and things like that. And we definitely offer consultative uh, 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 visits and I have a doctor working with me, which is very exciting. And so reach out to us to see if we can be helpful to you because I do, I mean, my goodness, the, you know, we get so much great feedback from your uh, patients or sorry, from your people listening, uh, chef AJ, and people are so hungry for just good information to make good decisions about their, uh, medical uh, care. Because the thing that we do in our practice is we spend time with you to get to know you and then give you advice that is customized to your story. Because in 10 minutes, you cannot get all the information, get all your questions answered and get a really customized approach to your menopause journey. And the thing about menopause is, is you're a moving target, especially in perimenopause. What you need now might not be what you need in six months. And you need to see someone who's going to pivot with you and empower you to understand the changes and also to not suffer. You shouldn't suffer. Uh, and I think, you know, again, this idea of the symptoms that you have, yes, oh, my sleep is bad. My, my skin is dry. You know, I've got low libido. We minimize those symptoms. But the point is we shouldn't because if they matter to you, they matter. And that we do have evidence-based medical treatments that can help with all of these things, but it has to be right for you in your medical story. Yeah. Well, people are saying you've changed their lives. You've taken their health to the next level. You give so much information. They're thanking you so much. You're so helpful. And here's a question from Donna. What are some options of bioidentical FDA regulated estrogen? Yeah. So anything that's estradiol. So estradiol patches are bioidentical. They come from the same place that the compounding pharmacies get their estrogen from. They're just regulated. So anything that has the word estradiol in it. So there are estradiol pills. Remember, I don't prescribe them very often because they're not as good for your libido. There are estradiol patches. There are estradiol creams. Uh, now brand names vary, right? There's different brand names for them. Um, there's an estradiol ring that we were just talking about. One is called... Um, uh, the E string, which is for local uh, estrogen replacement, you know, those little old ladies with urinary tract infections, the E string is great, but they make an estradiol ring that's high dose that helps people with hot flashes and night sweats and things like that. So there's two different kinds of rings out there. And so there's all sorts of uh, FDA approved bioidentical estrogen products. Now, testosterone, there's no testosterone product that's FDA approved for women, but I use FDA approved testosterone for men and I extrapolate it for my female patients because we know testosterone is very safe and effective for low libido in postmenopausal women. So I use it frequently in my practice. I don't use pellet therapies because pellet therapies are not regulated. And those pellet companies, if they cared about women, I'm going to say this very clearly, if they cared about women, they would do the work to go through and prove safety and efficacy for the world. We have FDA approved pellets for men. Why can't we have FDA approved pellets for women? And so I get very angry that these companies get to sell and market to people and say they're doing amazing things, but there is no regulation or accountability. And that makes me very angry because mm -hmm. I believe that we should be giving women safe and effective hormone therapies in menopause. Yeah. Somebody's asking about PMS. Yeah, PMS is actually, I was just uh, on a research call with an incredible Italian researcher who's been studying the menstrual cycle for decades and has a lot of interest in PMS and sort of the different hormonal regulation issues. And we were talking a lot about PCOS and PMS and androgen receptors, and it got very above my head in the basic science. But PMS is made for some people, and I spend a lot of time looking at pictures of the menstrual cycle with patients and really trying, in fact, I was just messaging with a patient 
patient right before this, who we, we were looking at the days in her cycle, she feels good. And the days in her cycle where she feels bad. And we're trying to extrapolate, is there a hormonal connection here? And for many people there is, and for, we, we sometimes uh, tinker, I would say we tinker, right? We have to figure out what, right, what works for that person. So is it that there's too little estrogen in that period, or there's too little progesterone, or is there too much progesterone? Some women have a bad reaction even to their own progesterone. And so it's really challenging, but I love talking with patients and, and using their, they know their bodies and they're going to sit there and they're going to understand patterns and they're going to work with you. And then they understand that we don't have all the answers, but this is where we, we, we sort of experiment and we figure out what is going to work for you. Thank you. What are your thoughts on natural remedies like yam root or herbs like black cohosh? So black cohosh has, is, is no better than placebo for hot flashes. So if it helps you, great, you can take it, but it, the data is and does not support that it should be used as menopausal hormone replacement therapy because it doesn't work uh, for if it, again, if it works for you, that's fabulous. If it, but, but don't think that that's the only treatment option that you have available. So I think we covered that earlier in the sense that, you know, diet and exercise are so fundamental and important, but if you have symptoms on top of those things, you deserve to understand that there are natural hormone remedies that are actual hormones that yes, may be a prescription, but are just as natural as, you know, taking a supplement, actually more natural than taking a supplement, which has zero regulation uh, uh, on it. Because if you go get black cohosh, they may not have black cohosh in the, in the pill that you're taking, right? There is no regulation. So I know if I'm giving you an estrogen patch that the FDA has at least looked at it and said, yeah, yeah, this is estrogen, uh, which is a, the natural form of estrogen that your body was making and is no longer making. So I think we're really hurting women by trying to make everything natural and supplements and, you know, it just, and, and all nutrition and all, you know, this is great, but you can't cure everything with meditation. And we have to stop telling women that it's all within, if only they eat more cleanly, if only they work harder at this, um, because so many people are gaslit into thinking that that's the case. And then you give them therapy, you know, a little bit of hormone therapy. And they just, they come back to me and say, Oh my God, I feel like me, Dr. Rubin. I'm back to feeling like me. Um, and it's like my, my job, my gosh, we had a friend over last night and my husband said, you know, she gets home from clinic and she's just so happy. She's tired, but she's so happy with, you know, what she's doing because she's making, you know, because she sees how much better people are getting. Perfect. Karen says, how can we find a menopause expert like you, but in our area? Yeah. So, um, and whenever patients email me, uh, you know, I always try to tell them, you know, there are people near them potentially, um, uh, the North American menopause society, which they can find at menopause.org org. Um, the North American menopause society has a find a provider. You can find my name there, the international society for the study of women's sexual health, which is ISWISH, I S S W S H.org has a find a provider, uh, uh, on their website. I'm on that website as well. So if you want someone who's a little bit more sexual medicine, and focused. Those are two fabulous websites that can get a, a, a clinician who at least is knowledgeable. That doesn't mean they know everything and it doesn't mean they're going to be as aggressive as I might be, um, but at least they're knowledgeable. And so, you know, showing up with you're now knowledgeable and you're trying to, to, to explain what you want to do, um, it's really empowering and it, it helps to guide the this, this story. But your general gynecologist or your general practitioner may not have had any classes in their training, not even one on menopause and hormone therapy. And so they, they feel the same way you do. Ooh, these are scary things. Oh, these cause cancer. Oh, these are dangerous, which is actually not true at all. There was an incredible viral article in the New York times a few months ago, all about menopause by Sue Dominus. I encourage everybody to read it. Uh, it was just so evidence-based and fabulous. Um, you can, I think, listen to it for free on the New York Times podcast, The Daily. There was a, it was a couple months ago, but it's all about menopause. And it is just an absolutely wonderful article. Um, and they quoted me in saying that menopause has the worst PR campaign of all time because we think it's just hot flashes and night sweats, but it's so many other things. Yeah. Beth says, how common is it to not be interested in sex? Nerds would rather read or do research. Does it always mean there's a hormonal issue? Yeah. So, you know, here's the thing about low libido. When you look at the data, about 40% of women have low libido, only about 10% are bothered by it because most women are not bothered by it. They're like, it's fine. I'd rather read a book. I'd rather eat a sandwich. It's, it's fine. I'm not bothered by it. 
But if you are bothered by it and you want to want, and you really are interested in being interested, then it's a medical problem. And there are medical solutions. Now, sometimes those solutions are reading a sexy book or putting yourself in sexy situations or working with a sex therapist. But there are some hormonal and non-hormonal based solutions that can boost dopamine in your brain and make you a little more excited. And so we know that testosterone helps low libido in postmenopausal women. And we know we have some FDA approved non-hormonal medications that can also boost dopamine in the brain to make sex a little bit more exciting. So it's not all medications, of course, but it's that what we call biopsychosocial. And the point is, is if you're bothered by it, then it matters. Um, my very good friend has a podcast called You Are Not Broken, and it's sort of all about libido and uh, uh, women's health. It's by Kelly Casperson. If you haven't had her on Chef AJ, I'm happy to make the connection. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because uh, she's just absolutely wonderful. And she she uh, wrote a book kind of all about this, where she takes a lot of the sex therapy research and really makes it applicable to people. Um, and so I, I really recommend it to people. Well, please introduce us because all my great guests like you came from other recommendations. So thank you. Um, Maria says, what percentage of people do you see with Marina that get depressed? Maybe you can talk about what M-I-R-E-N-A is. So the Mirena is a progestin-based IUD. Um, you know, the depression data on Mirena, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that there is a lot of data, but I'm not discounting if you are having depression with Mirena, then take the Mirena out, right? So the Mirena is a progestin-based IUD. It's pretty localized. It's a pretty small dose, but all, it's not, it may get, you may be more sensitive to progestins and your body, even with the littlest bit of progestin may not like it. And we know progestins can have effects on mood. And so if you are noticing depression with the Mirena, pop it out. You can put in a copper IUD. You can use a non-progestin based uh, uh, um, uh, treatment, um, but it, this is your experience and you deserve to be heard and taken seriously. Perfect. And then uh, speaking of Mirena, somebody's asking uh, Betsy, if you can have the Mirena coil as well as the EST ring at the same time, I'm guessing. Absolutely. You can do both. So the Mirena coil lives in the uterus. Uh, and so there's a little string that comes out in the vagina, but you could put a ring in the vagina. So they're, uh, they're not touching or interacting. And uh, in the vagina, there's plenty of room in there for more than one thing. So many of my <laughs> patients, when they have those rings in there, uh, their partners, they have a penetrative sex. They never, they don't even bother to take it out because again, the, you got to think a watermelon can come out of that vagina. So it can fit, you know, multiple things in there at once. I love that. There's more room for more than one thing. That's funny. Uh, Rachel's saying she loves your microphone. It looks so retro. Uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's one of my first times using it. So uh, hopefully cool. the sound quality, hopefully the sound quality works. Right, you sound great. It looks good too. And somebody's asking, Suzanne is saying, can acupuncture help with some of the perimenopausal symptoms? I, I, I got to say acupuncture helps me with everything. I had TMJ for years and nothing worked until acupuncture for me. I Again, individual, if it works for you, fabulous. It's wonderful. But um, it, it can, what I would say is, is it ever been proven to bring estrogen back in your body and prevent osteoporosis? No, right. There's no good data for that. But if it helps you as part of your customized approach to your menopause story, then it's wonderful. A couple of people are talking about people in their families that died of breast cancer and that are afraid of taking hormones. Listen, I hate breast cancer like everybody else does. It is horrible. And breast cancer early detection has been incredible to save lives and to prevent disease and things like that. And so we have to understand that women are more than just breast tissue. And so the fear of getting breast cancer should not inhibit you from living your life and having a good quality of life, whatever that looks like for you. So just because you have a family history of breast cancer does not mean you are not a candidate for certain therapies. In fact, in that big, scary study with hormones that made everyone nervous, there were two arms. There was the estrogen only arm and the estrogen and progestin arm. And we can talk about the details, but people who didn't have a uterus, who just took estrogen had a decreased risk of getting and dying from breast cancer. Okay. So it's not as simple as hormones cause cancer. It's not that simple. People who had 
estrogen only had a decreased risk of getting and dying from breast cancer. That's real. And so it really makes you like, you have to understand that hormones are not all good, not all bad. The effect on the breast is not all good, not all bad. And so it's really nuanced. And that's why you have to see a specialist who understands these things. But at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable with what goes into your body and what kind of therapies that you're doing. But women, especially if you have a genetic predisposition, your risk of breast cancer is real. It's a real thing. And you can't change the genetics. What you can do is not drink alcohol, right? You can exercise, you can maintain a healthy body weight, and you cannot smoke. And those things are actual proven evidence-based things that you can do to decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. So if you're having a glass of wine at night, you have a real meaningful increased risk of getting breast cancer. And so again, there is no level of alcohol that is safe. And I, um, it's just the truth, right? That doesn't mean- You're not the first doctor to say that this week. Thank you. But it's- It's your body, your choice. If you choose, right? If you, I had a sip of my husband's beer last night. If you choose to take alcohol, you're making a choice and that's fine. You get body autonomy. The same should be true for hormones because the risk of hormones is not nearly what the risk of alcohol or smoking or excess body weight and things like that. And so that's why I really want to empower women to understand the data so that they can have ration. They're really making good decisions about what they put into their body. Yeah. This may be one of the funniest comments ever put in the chat with three big laughing faces. Michelle says, instead of worrying about a woman's low libido, why don't we just give men a pill to calm them down? <laughs> Listen, you're not the first person to suggest it. And so libido mismatch, I, I take care of men as well. And I can happily to come on and talk all about men's sexual health and quality of life and things like that, because I do think it's important too. Yeah. And so, you know, I, libido mismatch is going to be a thing in every couple I see, whether it's two women, two men, multiple women and men, right? No matter what the love triangle is, it's really hard to get everyone's libidos the same. And so that's when education, communication, and, um, you know, and just a big understanding of how the biology works is so important for couples to maintain fun and happiness and togetherness sort of in the, you know, as they grow old together. Thank you. What, can you please repeat the name of the book you mentioned in the, the author? I think it was Casper. Yeah. So Kelly Casperson, it's You Are Not Broken is her podcast and her book. Um, she's great. I'll make sure she gets on here because I think everyone would love to hear from her. And again, I we are a growing army. I want everyone to join my newsletter at rachelrubinmd.com. Follow me on all the social media channels except TikTok. I haven't ventured there yet. D-R Rachel Rubin, R-A-C-H-E-L, last name R-U-B-I-N. Um, and we'd love to get more information more quality information because it, it, it doesn't, I don't have to be your doctor, but you have to advocate for yourselves. Um, if you want me to be your doctor, sure, we can work something out, but you have to advocate for yourselves and you need to seek good knowledge and not all doctors know all the same things. They can't, there's, there's no way to know everything about everything. So give your doctors a little bit of, of grace and find people who genuinely study this extra care about this and really know the data. Fantastic. Do you have time for one more question? Yes, one more. Fabulous. Thank you. From Jennifer. I, uh, how do I know if I'm out of menopause and if it's okay to stop taking progesterone? I assume and hope I don't have to stay on it forever. Well, so actually this is where it's a really important question of, and I don't know what you're, if you're just on progesterone, if you're on other things that I don't know, I don't want to stay on something forever. Um, Vaginal hormones should be forever. So vaginal estrogen or vaginal DHA should be forever because you will risk a urinary tract infections, right? When you're 90 and you have no estrogen down there. So it's just like, when do you stop brushing your teeth? When do you stop wearing your seatbelt? You do it forever. So if we took your thyroid out, you had thyroid cancer, guess what you would take forever? Thyroid hormone, and you wouldn't complain about it. If your pancreas stopped making insulin, what would you need forever to stay alive? insulin, right? Like you would need insulin and you wouldn't complain about it. So the question is, what role do hormones play? And this is a bit controversial and it's individualized and it depends on why you're on hormones in the first place. But I think we have a lot of emotions and and, and feelings around sex hormones that we don't necessarily have with thyroid and insulin and things like that. So um, I can't speak to your hormone regimen specifically, but for all of the women listening, listening who are on vaginal estrogen products, estrace, uh, 
uh, Vagifem, Uvafem, uh, E-string, uh, uh, Intra Rosa, those should be forever because I want to prevent you from getting urinary tract infections. I don't care if you're sexually active. I don't want you having frequency and urgency and leakage. And I don't want you to get urinary tract infections, which can lead to antibiotic resistance, sepsis, and death. Right. Thank you so much. Great comment from Dave. He's, he's going to pass on the libido lowering pill. <laughs> we understand. Dave, Dave, we understand. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure having you on. Please come back anytime. We love uh, your passion for this subject and you're just so knowledgeable. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Thanks for having me, Chef. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in an hour for another fabulous doctor who's going to answer your question. A Q&A with Dr. Ron Weiss. The doctor is in. Thank